Jackson, two fifty. Sister Alice Penex, one dollar. Mario Dalawa, one dollar. Kind of negative way. I mean, you'll never be the same in terms of the, the negative things that you have experienced in this world. You will certainly not be able to see the present world from an entirely new perspective. You'll be able to understand the politicians even when they don't understand themselves. You'll be able to understand yes. the sociologists. We thank you for everything that you gave us as a system. We didn't finish yet, but we will continue at a later time. Simply because so we want to thank you and thank you and thank you again for everything that you gave. And, the elevated and may Allah continue to bless you. We have our brother, Dr. Naeem Akbar, who speaks or assists our chief minister, the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad, he's on the radio now, so give them your undivided attention. Assalamu alaikum. We are engaged in probably the most difficult task that the world has ever seen. Because never since the original creation of the world has the world been faced with such a necessity for a thorough purging and recleaning. I don't mean any kind of physical purging. I don't mean the, though it needs that too to some extent. But the kind of purging that this world needs is a spiritual and mental purging that will clean up the considerable amount of filth, evil, and indecency which has come to rest and infect the mind and the thinking and the very lives of every human being on the earth. That's our job. That's the mission of the nation of Islam. We are not here to try to get a seat on a bus or a stool at a lunch counter or to be able to participate on the Human Relations Council of some city. We don't afford an office in the ghetto to have a poverty program to help one or two people. Our mission is a gigantic mission. Our mission is one to change the very composition, the very nature and the very makeup of the entire world. That's quite a task. That's quite an assignment. But we didn't dream that assignment up. A man who has been blessed to open his mind up to the wisdom of God, the Creator Himself, has come to us and told us that this is not the mission that we should choose to take, but this is the mission that Almighty God, Allah, has chosen us to take. So, like it or not, enjoy it or not, feel up to it or not, God has a better idea. All praise to Allah. All praise to Allah. So brothers and sisters, we want you to sit back, enjoy, but most importantly, ask Allah to bless you with an understanding of what the Chief Minister brings us to. Because what he is bringing us to by way of what he's bringing to us enough to make every individual life a new life and to make the entire life of the entire community a new kind of community life. So sit back. Don't be anxious. We have lots of time. Don't be in a hurry. It's going to be so much snow out there anyway you'll enjoy being here. So just make yourself comfortable and forget about all those things that are going on out there. Right now, along with this temple now, which is almost completely filled, there are 52 cities around the United States whose ears are listening to the same voice that your ears will be listening to. There are many, 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 many people around the United States whose minds are open to receive the same message that you will be receiving today. So don't think you are alone. Don't think you are isolated. 
Don't think that this is a little hidden club behind the bushes on Stony Island. Just remember that the whole world is listening. But 52 cities we know about, those are the ones we hooked up. We know that they have hooked up many more. All praise to you a lot. All praise to you a lot. Praise to you a lot. The brothers and sisters, at this time, it gives me a great honor and pleasure to present to you a man who is a newcomer here on the staff, laboring staff, here in Chicago. As many of you know that for many, many years, the Midwestern region of the Nation of Islam has been a region that didn't have a separate regional minister because it was under the direction of headquarters here in Chicago. But if you recall, just a few weeks ago, the Honorable Wallace C. Muhammad says that it's time to get organized. Though you don't like organization, you need organization. And ever since those words came out of his mouth, we have seen nothing but some organization. Now, one of the most recent aspects of this new organization is bringing to Chicago a truly well-qualified, dynamic minister in his own right. But he has already distinguished himself by serving as the assistant minister and kind of administrative minister to Minister Abdul Halim Farrakhan in New York City for many years. He also served as a minister in one of the satellite temples in New York City. And recently, over the last several months, he has been the minister in St. Louis, Missouri. This minister of whom I'm speaking is none other than our brother, an outstanding minister, an outstanding worker who's already brought joy to the heart of the Honorable Wallace C. Muhammad, Minister Abdel Kareem Aziz. Let's give him a big hand. In the name of Allah, the beneficent and merciful, peace and blessings be upon his servant and his messenger Muhammad forever. I mean, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So our beloved leader and teacher, the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad, I would like to thank him for this opportunity to speak to you and his many followers throughout America in over 52 cities. I would like to also thank our beloved leader and teacher for this opportunity to come to Chicago and to work with him on the Midwest region, and I should say to work under him in the Midwest region. I would like to say, thank you, Brother Minister. I would like to say to our brothers and sisters who are in the temple, those of you who are visiting us, perhaps for your first time, I know that you're in what you would call a different kind of uh, religious setting. And many of you who have come through the doors of Muhammad's temple from city to city throughout America and here in Chicago this afternoon to hear the words of our leader and teacher, I know that you're waiting and you're wondering what will you hear. You've heard about the nation of Islam. Many of you just know us as maybe black Muslims, uh, Muslims, but you know something about us. And this afternoon you have come to hear the man who is leading and guiding the nation of Islam throughout America and soon around the world. I would like to say to you, to our brothers and sisters who are visiting us, I want you to listen to the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad this afternoon. He is a different kind of man. He is a man of truth in a world of lies. He tells a bold truth and he lays it out. He doesn't hold back at all. Regardless of where it may find you and what you may be doing, he will put the spotlight on you and tell the truth. He all praises due to Allah. You know, there is a scripture in the Bible that reads about how God shines the light of his sun on evil and good, and he sends forth his rain on the just and the unjust. 
very beautiful parable in the Bible. And it's not that the uh, truth has a good guy and a bad guy that it falls on, but it falls on all equally. But where the difference is that there are those who respond to truth and there are those who do not respond to truth. There are those who close their minds to truth and fight off truth, and there are those who accept truth. There's a story of a man, and many of you who know the language of the Honorable Master Elijah Muhammad can tie it into his teaching us about a man who went to a cave. But there was a man who went to a cave, or there was a man who was in a cave, and he went outside of the cave and he saw a world. And there were a whole lot of things in that world that he knew those in the cave didn't know anything about. So he went back in the cave and he told them there was a world out there. Come on out and let me show it to you and there's a whole lot of things that we can do in that world. But when he came in the cave and began to tell them, they looked at him, strange. They said, well, where is he coming from? They didn't want the world that was outside. They tried to block it out of their minds and he even threatened to kill the man for the world that he was going to bring them into a knowledge of. But they were like in a cave, and in that cave, their movement was limited. There were some things they could do and some things they wouldn't do. But to find out whether they were really men or whether they were really women would be when they went out into that world. You can have a thing, as the Honorable uh, Wallace D. Muhammad has made us to see clearly, that you can have a thing, and you don't know what that thing is until you free it. So for the le last 11 months, our leader and teacher has been working on our minds. He's been talking to us about mind, the development of the mind, and how the mind must be fed. Because he has a mission to perform, a mission, a duty to do, not only to the Balalians of America, but to the entire world. He's saying to us, who are our helpers, who are my helpers in this cause? Who will stand and help me? I have to know whether I have Muslims standing by me or not. And the only way that he could find out whether or not he had Muslims standing with us, he had to give us the freedom so we could go out in the world and check ourselves out. And as we went to that world, all praise and truth to our love. As we went out to that world, many of us found, wow, I'm not a Muslim at all. We found that the world had a gravitational pull on us. And it pulled us this way and it pulled us that way. But the main thing that happened that was so beautiful, it allowed us to see our true self. Because we're following now a man of truth. And he brings that truth forth and he wants you to see yourself because he knows that the only way that we can deal with ourselves is when we see our true self. All praise is due to Allah. So very beautifully, as a follower of the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad, he has said to us in one of our ministry classes when he first began to call us into Chicago, he said to us, brothers, he was talking to the ministers, there are many things that you may desire to do, but because of your position, you can't do them. There are many things that you may want to do, but you have a position of responsibility. There are people looking to you. There are people who are looking to you for guidance, so there are things that you must put on, push on the side. And even if it causes you to make a sacrifice of things that you desire, you must push that to the side because there's a greater mission for you, a greater job that we must do. Now, as he said that to the ministers, I want to say in my few minutes here before you, I say that to my brothers and sisters throughout America. The Bilalian community, black community, looks to the nation of Islam. Though they may not be in here with us, they look to the leadership of the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad and what we stand for. They say that when I get straight, you hear them in the street, when I get straight, I'm going to join the nation. I'm not going to get married until I can get me a Muslim sister. You know, when I, when I get myself together, brother, I'm coming into the temple. This is what the greater black community has been saying for years. The Bilalian brother feels that this is the ultimate end, the nation of Islam. That means that we have an image in that community. And it's an image where people see hope in us. They feel that it's the nation of Islam that offers hope to the Bilalian community from coast to coast. And being that Allah has blessed us with that image, and today he has blessed us with a leader who can strengthen that image and move it forward, then we don't, not only do the ministers have an obligation, but every Muslim in America has an obligation. If you see that the hopes of your people 
is in the leadership of the Honorable Wallace B. Muhammad in the Nation of Islam. And you know that they are looking to you for strength. They're looking to you for guidance. Then there are things that you may desire to do on an individual level, but how would it affect the whole? So you got to look at it closely and say that if God has blessed the nation with this, if God has blessed the nation to be the hope of the black world first and then all humanity, then we have something to fight, struggle, sacrifice, and yes, even die for. All praise is due to our Lord. So our leader and teacher, the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad, is struggling against overwhelming odds. And you know, I know we have visitors who are here with us for the first time, and you may not, you may see the nation of Islam in its historical aspect, you know, the early days, Master Farad Muhammad, the 40 years of work of the Honorable Master Elijah Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah forever be upon him. Then you see his son emerging. Then you see the nation beginning to make a move forward to spread this message to all who would listen. You may see it in that light, but there's a man that stands in the front of that nation. He has a job. He's like a man fighting a battle on many fronts. He has to fight a battle because there's enemies who would love to crush and destroy the nation of Islam and what it represents. He has to put his hand up and hold that enemy off the nation. Then there are people who are in the mud of America suffering. He has to call them to the brightness of the rise of Islam and his leadership. Then there's the Muslim community who are already in the boat. He has to try to keep them together and keep them going along in a direction. So he's a man fighting on all fronts trying to keep that ball going. All praise is due to Allah. So, So I say to my brothers and sisters who are listening to me throughout America, let us get behind our leader and teacher and examine yourself. You know, as he taught us on mind, he caused us to step out of ourselves as Muslims. When we first heard the divine word, we were Negroes and niggers. We were in the mud of America. And when we heard that, as he called it, a shock treatment, the, the early language was language that shocked our brains. And when we got that shock treatment, we checked ourselves out and we saw how um, wicked we were. We wanted to make a change. Now the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad says that now you got to look at yourself again, brother. You have to look at yourself again, sister. There's a work to be done. And in order for us to do that work, number one, we have to examine ourselves and what is my motive? What am I here for? You know, is it just myself or am I concerned with all humanity? Am I concerned with that brother and sister out there who can't find their way to the temple, who doesn't have a pair of shoes, who is suffering, who is hoping for the welfare check to come, who is scraping to get food? Am I concerned with them? Am I concerned with that brother who is in a jail cell now? Not because he wanted to be there, because he was a victim of a set of circumstances that he had no control over. Am I concerned with that one? Then if you are concerned with all of those, then you have to first be concerned with the mission of the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad. I want to say this to my brothers and sisters who are in a position to help our leader and teacher today. And he, he has the help of God, which is sufficient, but this is a chance and an opportunity for us to be in the divine work. Don't back him with your mouth, back him with your work. Don't back him by saying, that's right, uh, Chief Minister, that's right, Chief Minister, but what can I do, dear beloved Chief Minister, to get involved and help you in this divine mission of spreading Islam throughout the world? All praise is due to Allah. What has taken place, we have seen the power of Islam move throughout the world. We saw it start on the Arabian Peninsula, spread across North Africa, then spread eastward into uh, India, into China, into the Philippines, down into Indonesia. We watched Islam spread down into black Africa. And as the master wrote one time that the Muslim warriors rolled to the coast of West Africa, and there was the Atlantic Ocean, they could not cross it. Islam did not enter into the Western Hemisphere. But God said that he would perfect his religions over all of the religions. And here in the Western Hemisphere, people who had been brought down to the lowest on the planet, all man had given up hope on that Falalian or black man of America. Then Islam crossed the borders 
And it didn't go into the White House and into the high circles, but it came to that man in the mud who proved the power of Almighty God. All oh, praise be to our Lord. So, now Islam is in the Western Hemisphere. The Honorable Wallace C. Muhammad steps forth and says that, you know, we have a mission that will go to all humanity. We will spread it in the Western Hemisphere and then the world, we will put a dome on the world and the dome on the world will make this world a house of Allah. Now, if we are invited to partake in that mission and we represent the hope of the world, then we must protect the image that God has blessed us with. And we must back up that man who is bringing us the word from God. We must stand behind him. We must be what he is representing this world that he is building to be. We must be that in our hearts. So I say to my brothers and sisters, I don't know when I'll talk to you again, but I want to work for and under my lead and teacher and do all that I can to help him in this divine mission. And I ask every one of you to commit yourself today as you're going to listen to him this afternoon that you will stand behind the chief minister and whatever he asks his nation for, he won't have to wait for it, we'll bring it to him the next day. May Allah bless you. Salaam Alaikum. When this chief chooses from his tribe, he chooses the bravest of the brave. Let's give him another big hand. So Midwest, you better look out, because the chief has put a little head over you, a little chieftain over this little part that is going to cause the rest of the country to really have to wake up to keep up. So we are very grateful to the Chief Minister and very grateful to Allah for uh, Minister Aziz, who certainly will do a fantastic job to help the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad in this part of the United States of America. So brothers and sisters, that's not all. We have quite a day for you today. I'm telling you, you're going to already be up there when the Chief Minister comes, so he'll just keep you there. Our next speaker is another very, very, very dynamic brother who has done one, well, two very significant things very recently. One of those things is that, well, let me tell you something else about him. He is the minister of Muhammad Temple number 7A1 in New York City. Now, this temple in New York City is a, is a temple in Spanish Harlem. So the members of that particular temple are primarily members of the Puerto Rican community in New York City. So he is a minister. All praise be to Allah. So he is a Spanish-speaking brother himself from the Dominican Republic and has lived in New York City and has been a follower of, first of all, the teachings of the Honorable Master Elijah Muhammad for many years, and certainly now is a very dedicated follower and helper of the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad. The Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad back last June made a commitment that he was going to remake the world. And he didn't mean that as idle gossip, he meant that as a commitment. So Minister Abdullah was commissioned recently to begin to prepare a weekly translation of the Muhammad Speaks articles in the Bilalia News to translate the articles of the Honorable Wallace C. Muhammad into Spanish. And these articles will be put into the Bilalia News and sent around the Caribbean and South America and all the other Spanish-speaking countries in this area and around the world so that our Spanish-speaking brothers will begin to know firsthand in their own language what the chief of the world is talking about. All praises be to Allah. All praises be to Allah. So brothers and sisters, you're in for another treat. He set the minister's class on fire last month. And so we present to you Minister Muhammad Abdullah of New York City. In the name of 
of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, peace and blessings be upon his servant and his messenger Muhammad forever. There is no God but Allah, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. As-salamu alaykum. To our beloved brother minister, Dr. Akbar, and especially to our brother, beloved chief minister of the nation of Islam, I thank him from the bottom of my heart for this opportunity. Assalamu alaikum is a very beautiful word. And it means the peace be unto you. Significa en español la paz sea con ustedes. So since I'm speaking in Spanish, I would like to say the greetings in Spanish. En el nombre de Allah, el benéfico, el misericordioso, la paz y las bendiciones sean sobre su siervo y sobre su mensajero Muhammad por siempre. Amén. This is a... Assalamu alaikum is an Arabic word. Peace be unto you, la paz sea con todos vosotros. Now, we come here in North America and you sit down and you say, why is this fellow talking Arabic? I am an English speaking person, I am a Spanish speaking person, and this fellow he is speaking in Arabic. Now, many of our four parents, the great majority of us, if we are from African heritage in the Western Hemisphere, whether we are from the North America or for, whether we are from Colombia or from Brazil or from Mexico, or from the Caribbean area, if we are of African descent, many of our parents said, Assalamu alaikum. But they lost their language due to the fact that we were colonized by the Europeans and many of the other people didn't speak Assalamu alaikum, but they did say peace in their Indian tongues. So today, since Islam has arrived to us, the lost and found nation of Islam, people that once were Muslims, people that prayed to Allah and were not considered dog sins, and were not considered niggers, were not considered sticks, people that were proud of their heritage, this is coming to us because indeed we need peace. We need peace because the world has gone mad. And assalamu alaikum is the best greeting anybody could give. Praises are due to Allah. Praises are due to Allah. Salam. It even sounds right. Salam. In English, we say peace with an explosive consonant, peace. And in Spanish, we say paz with an explosive consonant. But in Arabic, we say salam. Now, how do we attain peace? How do I attain peace? How do the world attain peace? Now, most people would like to attain peace, but most people are not peaceful because they do not know how to be peaceful and how to attain peacefulness because they have not been, they have not been given the knowledge of how to attain peacefulness. To attain peacefulness is a science because as the Honorable Wallace bin Muhammad just taught us in the tape that we recently heard, we come to this physical world to contend with an environment that we do not know, and we are supposed to master ourselves in this environment, and then after we master ourselves, we are supposed to master the environment and rule it. But we cannot do that unless we are at peace. Therefore, we have to be in accord with the nature of peace, in accord with the nature in which God, Allah, made things. But if we do not know that nature, 
If we do not know that law, we are at law. Religion is supposed to teach us that law. But religion has not fulfilled its commitment. Religion has taught us that to be peaceful is to be poor, for blessed are the poor. to attain peace. You had to die to go to heaven. Right? So we didn't strive for peace in this world. We wanted to die and go to heaven. But the Honorable Wallace B. Muhammad is here to tell us that we can attain peace and heaven while we are living. But only with one thing, or only with one, um, uh, with one uh, commitment, and that is that we learn the human machinery, the human mind, in relationship to its creator and in relationship to the universe. Now, how can we understand the, the human mind if no one teaches us? If those that taught us religion taught us not natural things, but they taught us supernatural things. They told, us, they told us about the Virgin Mary and how she conceived a baby by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and, <laughs> they told us about the miracles. So people are looking for miracles and miracle makers, right? Now, the religion of Islam is not a supernatural religion. The religion of Islam is a natural religion. And it is a religion that causes you to be humble. In Christianity, the wealthy sit in the best of seats. And when they die, they get the best masses to get them out of purgatory. But the poor that have no money to pay for that mass remain in purgatory. The poor that have nothing uh, is a second class citizen of the kingdom of God. But in Islam, we are equal because God created us equally with the same right to govern ourselves and to attain mastery. This is why Islam is not a local religion, but it's a universal religion. Now, Islam has done right here in America the, the unheard of. When you came inside this door today, you saw organization. You saw cleanliness. You saw beauty. This among the Bilalian black American community of America is unheard of. Never in the history of this country have we seen so much cleanliness among the Bilalian community. So much wisdom, so much organization. Because Islam has been able to give the Bilalian community this organization. The black man of America, the Bilalian man of America is a man that has been totally stripped of the knowledge of himself. He lost his language, he lost his God, he lost everything. So he he in search for God, he should stop. In search for God, he goes to church and just goes and, 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 and becomes so emotional that he forms out of his mouth. In search for God, he, bec he becomes a prostitute. In search for God, he or she do foolish things. This, we, the, the plight of the black or the Bilalian community of America is a terrible plight. And only a powerful teaching can bring these people out. Now, Islam has done that for the last 40 years. And if we can see these Bilalian community raising up with the most uh, uh, sickening diseases uh, sociologically, with the most sickening uh, uh, or, or, or the most devastating diseases uh, uh, psychologically, if we can see this nation growing and rebuilding itself through Islam, we better check it out and learn from them. We in Latin America are a multiracial people.
We have people of all colors, and we are very happy people, very emotional. But really, we need Islam. The reason why we need Islam, because most of us in Latin America have lost the knowledge of true religion. Now, I'm going to cut this short because very soon our chief minister is going to explain to us why, you know, we need Islam. He has a special message to us, the Latin Americans, because he, as a man born from this Western Hemisphere, as a man that was born of a people that were in total darkness, he is a man prepared with a heart and a mind to give to the world. The Villarian community has been a, a community that loves everybody. And indeed, the Villarian community loves everybody. It's, it's a fact. So the Villarian community is a beautiful and re receptacle to contain the word of God because they will give it to everybody. It is a fact. So we don't want to delay our time. And a mis hermanos y hermanas de habla hispana, quisiéramos de nuevo darle las gracias por haber venido. El ministro de la Nación de Islam estará con nosotros dentro de unos minutitos, así que no se impacienten. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. American consulates and other uh, diplomatic agencies here in the city of Chicago, and he has several, many special guests today from those uh, particular places. So you'll be meeting them directly later on, but we wanted you to know that's why he was uh, giving some of the greetings and explanations in Spanish, to let you know that Islam sounds good in any language. All praise to you, Allah. All praise to you, Allah. So brothers and sisters, this is truly a great day as you can feel. Even if you don't know what we are so happy about today, if you are in here, you can feel it. So you want to stay around and find out what it is that feels so good. And we can assure you that the word and the understanding and the wisdom that's being brought to us by the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad will not only make you feel good, that's a low level, it's easy to feel good, but the more difficult and the more complex thing to do is to learn how to think good again, because certainly we have been very poor thinkers for a long time, not because we didn't have the ability, not because we didn't have the brain apparatus, not because we didn't have the intelligence as they say, but because our thinking had become so misguided, because our thinking had been robbed of so many of its vital and necessary resources, such as knowing where we came from, knowing who we were, knowing where we were going, and most importantly, even knowing what we were as men and women. The Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad is here bringing that news, that news about what it means to be a man that news about what it means to be a woman, that news about what is the purpose 
of being here anyway. And as they used to say in the church, ain't that news, ain't that good news. Because certainly that was news we've been waiting for for a very, very long time. And the Honorable Wallace C. Muhammad is the only man who has the complete key to unlock all of the mysteries in the present world. He has the keys to all the mysteries that all the other religious scholars in every area of religion, be they Catholic, be they Jewish, be they Protestant, be they even Muslim, the Honorable Wallace B. Muhammad has the keys to the mysteries in their own scholarship. So we are blessed. We are blessed because as Minister Abdullah has said, if anyone would have been least expected, if anyone had been least suspected of being able to be given the highest wisdom on the planet Earth to lead the Earth into the highest wisdom, it would have been us. Because the Balawian community, the Balawian so-called black community, was truly the community in the world that was least expected of any good. Everyone looked it off and their heads just sort of dropped. We went to Africa and they would pretend they didn't even know us in Africa. We went to Europe and you know they didn't know us in Europe. They didn't even know us in America. Sometimes our own mamas would look at us and say, oh no, you ain't mine. We were truly a people who nobody wanted to have anything to do with. Why was that? simply because we had gone, we had been pulled, taken, so far off of the right track. And you know, very often people can imitate things better than the original is. And we had become such good imitators of evil and corruption that it really took something miraculous to begin to bring us around again. But brothers and sisters, we are proud to say to the world, that this Balawian community ain't what it was yesterday. We are proud to say to the world that whatever it is that the world needs an answer to, this Balawian community, this body Christ, this nation of Islam under the direction of the Honorable Wallace C. Muhammad has the answer to whatever your problem is. Now that's quite a boast. That's quite a, a, a bold statement to make. Well, the Honorable Wallace C. Muhammad is a bold man, a very bold man, a very courageous man. And he doesn't talk courage. He doesn't talk bravery. He demonstrates courage. He demonstrates bravery. He is an excellent model for everything that he tells us that a man ought to be. So brothers and sisters, if you will just observe the man, if you will listen to his words and watch his behavior, watch his movement, watch the decisions he makes, and when you watch those things and study those things, you will have to be convinced as we are convinced that Allah has blessed us here in North America and has given us the very cream of the crop in this leader and teacher, the Honorable Wallace B. Muhammad. So, in just a few minutes, you'll find out what we've been bragging about. In just a few minutes, you'll hear for yourself why we get so excited when this great man comes before us. Because, brothers and sisters, you know, we had such a serious problem here in North America that we had become sort of like the guinea pig for the whole world. Everybody was so convinced that we were beyond help that they tried some of everything just to see what they could do. But they didn't trust their methods themselves. They called in doctors and injected all kinds of chemicals into our bodies to try to change our bodies, to try to change our behavior. Their psychologists, their sociologists, their social workers, and all of their scholars wrote most of their best theories based on what they thought would be able to help our condition. But they had to come up with a new theory almost every year. Because everything they tried, we showed them that we could make them cry. 
because it didn't do too much good. And there was a change, a change began to take place in North America. A change began to take place in the Bilalian community only when Islam came to this community. Only when the teachings of the great master Elijah Muhammad began to penetrate the hearts and the minds of the Bilalians in North America did a change begin to come about. Suddenly those drug addicts that none of the drug counselors could do anything about began to straighten up and fly right. Suddenly many of those alcoholics that all of the kinds of abuse and alcohol programs had been able to do nothing for began to come around and stand up and be dignified men. Suddenly all of those so-called Negro scholars who had studied at the institution of America and had gained intellectual material, had gained theories, had gained skills and took those skills back to an alien community. Those people who had been educated to help their own communities but turned their back on their communities. Those people who the community looked for for help who had gone somewhere else to help those who didn't even need any help. When Islam got in America, those people began to turn around and look toward home and come toward home and began to give what they had been blessed to receive to their own communities. And now, today in North America, for the last 11 months is the Honorable... Muhammad has said, the curtain is drawn all the way back now. The stage, the company, everybody is on stage. And it's now time for the grand finale. And the director and the producer and the starring performer is none other than the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. Brothers and sisters, he has taken the nation of Islam, a body of babies, a body of babies just like all the other babies in North America. Babies, why? Because we were thinking in baby fashion. We believed that you could wave a wand and suddenly make things disappear. We believed, as our Christian brothers and sisters believed, that there was some kind of strange, miraculous way to solve the problems of the world. We believed that what the Bible said about our babies coming out of virgins, as Minister Abdullah was saying. We believed that prophets opening up seas with their rods. We believed that all of these strange stories we learned in Sunday school were true stories. And we brought those same stories into the nation of Islam. We said that we didn't believe in spooky things anymore, but we came into the nation of Islam and in a part of our growth, we had to learn baby language first. We had to learn to think as at least an intelligent baby first. We were crazy babies in Christianity. We were not just babies, but crazy babies. So it's all right to be a baby if you are a baby, but at least be a sane baby. So the Honorable Master Elijah Muhammad made the crazy babies into sound babies. And that was a 40-year job. A 40-year job. And he only got hold to just a very few of them in that time. But in the last 11 months, this masterful cultivator this masterful farmer, this man who knows how to cultivate even the most dominant seed, the most dormant seed that may be lost somewhere in this deep earth that's known as flesh, this great cultivator came with his fertilizer and his rake and his plow and his mule team and his tractor. And he began to till this earth known as the nation of Islam, began to shake it up, turn it over, pick it up, blow away the weeds in the field, and say it's time to plant a new crop here. 
It's time to go on and get a new crop planted. We've been producing fairly well for 40 years, but it's now to lay out a new field here. And so he began to plant a new crop. So on last February 26, 1975, the farmer stood at the top of the farm, looked out across the field and said, well, it's almost harvest time. The field looks very good today, so it's almost harvest time. So he said, the first thing I've got to do, though, is go and identify the wheat. And the only way that I can identify the wheat is by my wisdom as a wheat grower. Because God has given me the knowledge of the real nature of wheat. I know how to separate the wheat from the shell. Allah has blessed me with the knowledge now. Thanks to my father, the field has been well planted. Thanks to my father, the, wheel has been, the field has been planted with the best quality of wheat. But now, the field is grown up with tares and wheat. The tares look almost like the wheat sometimes. There are weeds there that carry the appearance of being just like the wheat. And ordinary anybody couldn't come in because they may destroy some of the wheat. An ordinary farmer couldn't come in because he may pick up some tares and put it in with the wheat. But for this bread that we've got to bake today, we've got to make the best choice of the best wheat. So it took God to train the harvester to do this. So the Honorable Wallace B. Muhammad walked in the field and he says, all right, it's time for me to harvest my good wheat. And he began to do things to separate the wheat from the chaff. And so he said, the first thing, he said, all right, sisters, come out of your uniforms and walk around and look like a dignified, mighty sister. And that was the wind that blew in the wheat field. And when that wind blew in the wheat field, some of the tares got blown away that time. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. And then he said, all right, that took care of some of the tares. So he said, all right, folks, brothers and sisters, you are no longer supposed to be babies. So now it is your responsibility, brothers, to begin to sell the Bilalia news, not because someone makes you sell it, but because you know this is the word of God and you want to sell it. And another wind went across the wheat field and some more tears went flying away. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. So the harvester stood there on the porch continuing just to say the word. And that's the power of this man. He proves to you what he said to us 11 months ago, that word makes you. He proves to you what St. John was trying to tell us in the first chapter. He said, in the beginning was the word. Because with this word from the Honorable Wallace B. Muhammad, a new life begins to come into the people. And so he said, I'm still not ready for the heart. So he says, all right, folks, brothers and sisters, we know that you are accustomed to everybody doing everything for you. We know that you are accustomed to being spoon-fed. We know you are accustomed to being instructed and directed when to move, how to move, when to jump, how not to jump, how to sit, how to stand, what to do, what not to do. We know that was necessary when you were crazy babies. But now we want to grow you into adulthood. So he says, all right, brothers and sisters, we're going to see how many tares we have in the field. We want you now to begin to govern yourself. That was a mighty wind. It blew across the field, and even some of the wheat began to toss around under that wind. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. But because, because there was a divine harvester on the field, because there was a divine harvester in this wheat field, when he said that, that only just blew away a few more of the tares because the wheat came right back up and kept on pushing. 
but the harvest has said it ain't over yet. We know that you have a lot of spooky ideas in your head. We want you to know that this work is going to be hard work. We want you to know that this is not a regional job, this is an international job. So he came up with the biggest wind of all. He says, all right, we know you like to think you are black Muslim. We know that you have prided yourself in your black supremacy. That was necessary to get you from being crazy to sane. But now we're going to blow a mighty wind. And he stood back on the porch and took a deep breath and called all places to go. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. So we don't have to say anything else about the harvester. We'll let the harvester stand right here and blow that wind and see how much wheat we have today. So I'll go over and see Muhammad. of all the prophets from Abraham to Muhammad, the greetings of peace, I greet you, assalamu alaikum. First, I must say I really thank uh, the ministers, Aziz and Minister Muhammad Abdullah and Minister Naeem Akbar for the great delivery that they made here this afternoon and for the support, the genuine support that they give me in this office. Uh, kind of hard to get started once people have put you up so high, you know, and praised you so much. <laughs> but, um, I don't feel that I deserve all that, but I know the office deserves all that, and even more. And when I speak of the office, I mean the <clears throat> mission that Almighty God has given us, and the responsibilities that we are charged with. It's worthy of all the praise that they gave it, and even more. <clears throat> now, brothers and sisters, I have well, many things I would like to say to you. I'll try to get to them as quick as possible. But I would like to do it as naturally as possible. Therefore, I don't want to rush into anything. Um, <clears throat> we have dignitaries out here from this Latin Amer American community and I want to thank them for their presence today it's a bad day today we have snow out there this is our main meeting our big meeting we've had so many nice Sundays and now on the fourth Sunday when I come out here to see you and talk with you and have snow out there well I hope it didn't stop anybody that's supposed to be here <laughs> <laughs> as long as it didn't stop anybody that's supposed to be here, then I'm all right. <clears throat> For the benefit of our honorable guests from the Latin American community, I want to say that, uh, tell you that when I speak, on religion, 
I don't feel that I'm speaking as a Muslim in the sense that the world see and accept Muslims. And I don't feel that I'm speaking as a Christian or as a Jew or as any particular religious society or uh, uh, people. I feel I'm speaking as one who believes in Almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and I have the right to speak and feel comfortable anywhere and with any people, because we all are one creation. And we all have one boss over <clears throat> The world has become so confused that it's pretty hard to really identify Muslims or Christians or Jews. Muslims have stopped living like Muslims. Christians have stopped living like Christians, and Jews long time ago stopped living like Jews. That is like they are supposed to live. So uh, <clears throat> it's kind of a big problem when we try to put labels on each other and deal with labels. The matter is made simple when we ignore the labels and deal with the content. And that's what we want to do. We want to deal with the content. And the Holy Quran tells us, and we can plainly see that when we study the great religious, the great religions and the great religious movements, the Holy Quran tells us that the divine content is the same in all the great religions. The Holy Quran tells us again that the messengers, the prophets, and messengers of God, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, all of them, the Holy Quran tells us that they belong to one prophethood, to one. They were expecting they preached and expected a Messiah, one like David, who would be brave enough to stand before the Romans, like little David stood before Goliath, and by himself challenge the great Roman powers and defeat them with truth. But when Jesus came up and won such great acclaim among the people, they didn't, uh, that is, the leadership, the established uh, leadership of the Jews, those strong sects in Judaism, they didn't respect, they didn't recognize uh, Jesus. They didn't accept Jesus. Why? Because Jesus wasn't the kind of Messiah that they were looking for. Instead of Jesus doing what they thought he was going to do, or what they thought the Messiah would do, he did what they never expected. They were expecting him to stand up and condemn Rome. But he stood up and condemned his own people. He stood up and condemned the hypocritical Jews. They didn't want him. But Jesus knew he was wise and divinely guided. He knew that you have to do first thing first. If a people has an enemy and oppressor over them and they can't do anything about their condition, 
they should first look at what's happening in their own hearts and minds. Because something has gone wrong within the community to make it possible for an oppressor to get a power, get power, power and a firm position over them. So Jesus went home at the real cause of the problem. He said, you lying, hypocritical Jews. You devils in disguise. All right. Now that man did a great work. He truly left the sign in history that a savior was indeed born. He was a savior. That's what it takes to save a people. The courage to do a thing that they don't like, but that you know is good for them. How good would the doctor be if he would be concerned about the taste of his medicine? He wouldn't be good at all because most medicine tastes bitter in the mouth. All praise is due to Allah. Just relax. And let your mind do right things for you today. See, most of us, we hold our mind back and we won't allow our divinely given mind, our conscience, to do right things for us. The book says that darkness would come upon the whole world. So Jesus' first appearance in Scripture is described as one coming under the cover of darkness in a dark time. A time when the earth was dark. That is, the society, the people were in darkness, the masses. But the leadership had light. See, the book speaks of two firmaments. And we have wrongly taken these firmaments to be earth and heaven, or physical earth and physical sky. The book is not talking about that. The book is talking about things that, are, that resemble in their nature in their purpose. They resemble physical earth and physical sky, but are not physical earth and physical sky. The book speaks of two firmaments, the lower and the upper. The lower one represents the ignorant people, the deprived, the rejected, the unschooled. And the upper firmament represents the favored. Those who were favored with knowledge and with wealth. And because of that, they have a position of power over the common people. Now, who favored them, uh, this upper firmament, in the beginning? It was God. In the beginning, God opening, opened the way to everybody to get wealth, to get knowledge. And those who had the best qualifications, they got the wealth and got the knowledge. But after they got it, then others began to envy what they had. And jealousy and envy came into the picture. And people began to war against each other and rob each other of their rights. Then the snake himself, the devil himself, the wicked mind, ungodly mind of men, 
hiding under religious garments conspired to take over that heaven that God originally established. Conspired to take over that original religious society that God first inspired to hold the torch of truth high for humanity. They conspired against them and got themselves in the seats of authority. So when Jesus came, this was the condition of Jerusalem. The conspirators were ruling the religious order, the hypocrites. They had the light, but they were withholding the light from the masses. Darkness wasn't on the firmament. Darkness wasn't over, wasn't over heaven. Darkness was over the earth. It was over the weak, the meek, the deprived. But the book says that Christ will return. It says that when he returns, he'll return in the clouds of heaven. The upper firmament will be dark and confused and disturbed. So today, brothers and sisters, we have lived to see that time. When darkness is not on the earth, the masses, the common people, they know what's right and know what's wrong. They have seen the wrongdoings of leadership. The average person out there in the street can condemn the preacher who's lying right now maybe in his pulpit. Today, darkness is not on the face of the earth. Darkness is over the heaven. The average person right now in the street can condemn government leaders for their conduct. But there was a time a few centuries ago when the masses were so kept out of everything before television, before literacy. <laughs> the masses were kept out of everything. And the people, the common lot, could not point a finger and judge those who were ruling over there. They had to contend with, they had to put up with whatever was put on them by the, by the leadership. But we have come to that time that the book prophesy of. That there will come a time when the ground will be lit with knowledge. The common people out there, they have light. They know truth. They can't read the Bible because they were not given the Bible. They were given a, 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 a reason, a rational mind. And they were given an, an experience of centuries of, of enslavement and deprivation. And this experience has lit their mind. And the natural conscience that Almighty God gave them lights their heart. So they're not in darkness, but the church is in darkness. The synagogue is in darkness. The mosque is in darkness. And I speak as an eyewitness. I've been around the Jews. I sit with them. I've been to Christian churches. I've sat with them. I've been in the mosques abroad. I've sat with them. And I know that darkness is upon the heavens today. But there's light on the earth. What does the book say? What will happen to remove the darkness of the heavens? The book says that his coming will be as a flash of light out of the east, even unto the west. I will explain this. Not by my own wisdom, but by what Almighty God has blessed us with.
In order to remove the confusion in religion today, it is necessary to go back to where this religious teaching started and trace it up to where we are today. We have to bring it from Jerusalem to Chicago and not have a single break in the chain of life that stretch from Jerusalem to Chicago. That's what has to be done before the religious order today can be lit up again with light. Why? Because someone has broken up that chain of light. They separated Abraham from Moses, Moses from Jesus, Jesus from Muhammad. They have put blocks of darkness in the great chain of prophets in the movement of truth from God to us. And in order to see clearly again, we have to again see that light stretching from the east to the west in an even, unbroken pattern. So what does the book say? It says that Jesus will come. When he comes, he will come to judge. He will come to condemn. He will come to reprove the righteous. To justify the righteous. He will come to satisfy the hearts and the minds. Those burdened hearts and minds. That have held on to truth in God. That have respected righteousness and humanity. But have suffered the greatest hell that any human being or any creature could be put in. He will bring comfort to their minds and to their hearts by explaining to them the thing that took place. And he will condemn the wicked. And who will the wicked be that he will condemn? They will be the same ones that he condemned before. That's why the return of this light is called Christ again. Because the job the man has to do is the same. He's not coming to chase common prostitutes and make them confess their sins. He's not coming to chase people who eat physical forbidden things. Those hog eaters who eat physical hog flesh. His return is not to chase them around and to make them confess their sins. He's not going to come pulling a finger down on earth. On his return, he does the same thing he did the first time he came. He points up at the heavens. The first time he came, came around, he pointed at the heavens. And he said, the earth is dark because the heaven is a hypocrite. <laughs> now, the second time he comes around, he says, the heaven is dark. The cause of God's judgment. You were a hypocrite. So God took the light away from you. And made your heavens dark. Now that's what I'm saying to you. That mosque, church, and synagogue have been hypocrites. And the heavens are dark today because God has condemned them and taken the light away. He cut the light off in the synagogue and in the church and in the mosque because they didn't deserve to have his light shining up there in that so-called heaven. Oh, how can you speak that way? Look at the good Christians have done. Look at the good the devil has done. 
Look at the good the, 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 the mom has done. Again, I say, look at the good the devil has done. Do you think the devil is all bad? The devil always show more good than he show bad. But he produced more hell than he produced heaven. The Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims, they have shown more good than they have shown, shown bad. But the, the effect that they have left on the earth has been more hellish than it has been divine. Oh, I don't speak before I give it a lot of thought. And I don't speak before I look at what God has established. So I don't speak from my own establishment. I speak from that that God has established. I went to Arabia. I found crooks. I was raised as a so-called Negro in Chicago. And the Jews I saw were crooks. Tavern owners. Pawn shop owners. My people lived under Christian rule for almost four centuries now. And our history is one of the cruelest kind of slave enslavement that you can read about anywhere. So let's look at the work and judge the doers of that work. I admit that there are some Christians who don't go along with the majority who never went along with or went along with the majority. I admit that there are some Jews who have never gone along with the majority. And there are Muslims who have never gone along with the majority. But you have to look at the facts. If the minority among the Jews are wicked, then the majority have let the minority come into power. If the majority among the Christians are good, then I say that majority have let a minority come into power. If the majority among Muslims are good, then that majority have let a minority come into power. Now that's the fact. That's the truth. If they speak from their scripture and they preach the truth, then they have to present something that will condemn them for what, for what they have done. I read the Bible, and believe me, I understand it. The Bible from Genesis, and I mean from the very first verse of Genesis, to the end of the book, preach against deceit, lying, craftiness, greed, murder, enslavement, hypocrisy. These things are condemned from the Genesis to Revelation. Preachers against materialism. The book from Genesis to Revelation goes after the protection of the weak, the unschooled, the deprived, 
But what have Christian establishment done? They have gone after the weak, the uneducated, the deprived, to put shackles on their arms and on their legs. That's the history behind us. And if it wasn't for us fighting hard and risking our lives every day for the last 40 years or more, we would be in shackles right now. I know what the Holy Quran preach. I read it and I understand it. The Holy Quran preaches against the withholding of knowledge from people wherever they be on the face of the earth. The Holy Quran preaches against a monopoly a holy monopoly of God's truth. But I found a man who hold a monopoly on the truth and pass out peanut hulls to the people who come to their mouth to hear them on Friday. Telling you what I've seen, I know what happened. Almighty God wouldn't have picked me before letting me know what was happening. And I don't want you to get spooky. I don't want you to get spooky and think that I'm saying I'm some supernatural being. Or some new Christ. Or new prophet Muhammad. No, I'm nothing but a common person like you are. But who, because of his sincerity, God has rewarded that sincerity with more light than he put on any man till this very day. How can you have more light than Christ Jesus? There was not a much, as much darkness when Christ Jesus was here. How can you have as much light as the Holy Prophet Muhammad of Arabia? There was not as much darkness when Prophet Muhammad of Arabia was here. The conditions were horrible in the times of those great men. But darkness hadn't covered the whole earth yet. The big old continent, almost a third of the world, hadn't even been discovered yet by that known world of yesterday. So look at all the problems that have come out of human nature and out of human society since Moses, since Jesus, since Muhammad of Arabia. The world has grown as in darkness like something corrupt, something filthy burning. And the dark smoke pouring out. It poured out so much in Moses' day, so much in Jesus' day, so much in Muhammad's day. But today the whole world is polluted, brothers and sisters. I'm not saying that I'm a greater man than any of those. I wouldn't dare say that. I wouldn't dare say that. I'm not saying that I'm a greater man than the last one, the last prophet from God. Muhammad may peace be on him. But I'm saying that light now is bigger and greater than it was in his day. And even the light that he held before the world, the whole Quran, it's bigger today than it was in those days. His knowledge was big. His knowledge was bigger than the knowledge that existed in the world at that time. But Prophet Muhammad of Arabia, he shouldn't, he couldn't, he was not in a position. The conditions hadn't been brought about. He couldn't give the world the whole light that he had received. He only could give the whole Quran. And if you don't have any sense, if you have not divinely inspired, you can read that whole Quran, and when you read it off to me, you might not light up my closet. Let's move the world. Now hold up. It takes some kind of understanding 
and conditions, experiment, experiment, circumstances, all of these natural things work to bring the light out more and more. They and as our understanding grow bigger, our light, our light, our focus, our light grow bigger because our focus has widened to take in more light. Do you understand? The people that Jesus spoke to, they lived in a world, the conditions, the circumstances, the experiments that they had undergone had, were only great enough to open the focus so much to receive so much light. Prophet Muhammad of Arabia, the conditions, the circumstances, the experiments that they had undergone were only great enough to open the focus of Arabia and the leadership of Prophet Muhammad only so much. But today, brothers and sisters, the divine plan is truly universal. It's in universal dimension. For the devil and his hell have went all around the world and have elapsed, has, 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 have put a band <laughs> from North Pole to South Pole around the equator. They have covered the earth with hell and confusion. And the people have experiments of hell and confusion all over the world. And now television and all these other modern inventions have focused the whole world scene so that the average man and woman anywhere in the world can look at the whole world picture at, the, at one time. So this has worked to open up the mind, to expand the mind of the common people. So the man that comes today, brothers and sisters, he can give more light because the uh, receptors are bigger. The focus of the people is big enough to see the light. Whereas yesterday it was too small to see the light. And I said that to explain what I said. I told you that the light that God has sent me with is bigger than any light that shone before from the men before. It's not bigger than the Holy Quran. It's not bigger than the Bible. But it's bigger than the Bible that this world has seen so far. It's bigger than the Holy Quran that this world has seen so far. Do you understand? I know what the people will say. They'll say, he talks a lot, he's a big boaster, but, it, but they're just empty words. The man has, can, can't be compared with Moses and Christ Jesus and Muhammad of Arabia. Well, I've been preaching now for less than almost a year. Go back and look at what Jesus did in one year. Look at what Moses did in one year. Look at what Muhammad of Arabia did in one year. And then come back and answer that person again for me. measure what I've done with the finished work. I haven't finished. I just got started. And if God 
blessed me to do all the things that he's shown me. I believe 10 years from today, there'll be great populations confessing that this is truly the return of the life of Christ and Muhammad. They will confess that the hope that has been in the people for the return of Christ and for the return of the life of Muhammad as he presented it in his day has been answered in this mission right here in America among the Bilalian community. I believe that the time will come within 10 years that it will be common knowledge that it is confessed high and low that the Lord's foundation of Islam is the manifestation of the true light of Christ and the true light of Muhammad. Now you just hang around here for 10 more years. Jesus was on the scene, he worked with what was left behind him and with what God had blessed him with. So did Prophet Muhammad of Arabia. Now I have all of them behind me and God has blessed me and inspired me in the same way that he inspired them. To see into darkness and point out what is right and what is wrong. That's the blessing of God that he gives to prophets. He doesn't only give that blessing to prophets, he gives that blessing to anyone who deserves it. There's not a need for prophets anymore. Prophets come to put light again on the path of God so that people will be able to distinguish the path of God among other paths. Prophets come to show again the way of God when that way is lost. The Jews lost the way. They got off on the wrong path. They were preaching spiritual teachings, spiritual values, but the path they were walking on was the path of material conquest. They were on the road to manifest as any common tyrant. So God sent Jesus to stop them and take the favor away from them. And Jesus told them that the Son of Man came to the fig tree for fruit and it had no fruit to offer him. So he said, Cursed be the fig tree. Fig tree was a symbol of Judaism. He said, Cursed be the fig tree bear fruit no more. And the book said it right away withered up. Didn't wait. As soon as he spoke it, it was all over. Said right away the fig tree withered up. Meaning as soon as Jesus opened his pure mouth and his sincerity was heard, the hypocritical Jewish establishment was finished. They couldn't attract and lead righteous people anymore. They could only keep what they had. That was their materialistic so-called uh, righteous establishment. They kept their own people 
But they didn't win people from the world anymore, did they? They didn't go out preaching in the world anymore like they did before Jesus. Look how Jeremiah preached. How Ezekiel preached. Look how Moses challenged Pharaoh in the name of God. But after Jesus came, we didn't see Jerusalem. We didn't see the Jews out on the world scene standing up for God. They went into secrecy. They teach their children behind closed doors. They are not seen out in the open inviting people to the way of God and condemning the world for its wrong. Why? Because they know that they had gotten in the top. They had gotten a top seat among those wrongdoers that keep the world miserable. <laughs> and when Jesus condemned them openly, they just couldn't come out no more. So right away, they withered away. Is that right? All right, let's go on with it. You might not be ready to move on where God is moving us, but we got to move on. taken away from the Jew and given to the Christian. The Christians became God's mouthpiece in the world. The Christian movement began to point the finger at Pharaoh and condemn Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Is that right? I'm not talking about Pharaoh of Egypt now. I have to talk to some of these that have a problem of rusty locks and know all to grease those rusty locks and no key to open it even if they greased it. But the Christians stood up and took the, the, the job, the role from the Jews and began to condemn evil tyrants in the world for oppressing and corrupting the society. The Christians came into power and they fell victim of the same thing that the Jews fell victim of. They got the material wealth and they started oppressing others. Instead of carrying light to those in darkness, they carried slavery to those in darkness, chained them and kept them back from education and real scriptural meat, divine truth, gave the world, that is the general society that accepted Christian rule. The leadership gave them scriptural drunkenness. What do I mean by that? A lot of spirit, but no vision. A lot of spirit, a little intelligence. A lot of spirit, little reasoning. And just made the masses of our people drunk in religion. I remember as a child walking through the streets of Chicago and I passed by churches and they really excited me. Sometimes I was frightened by a sudden outburst from a storefront church. Sound like people were fighting in the place. I'm not making fun, believe me, I'm very serious. The sound of furniture falling, falling, door slamming, screaming, 
people jumping up and down. So when I got old enough to go to the church for myself, because when I was little, I, I wouldn't ask my parents could I go to church. But when I got in my teens and felt that I could go, and I had excuse then, so well, I'm going fishing. But really, I wasn't going fishing. I wanted to go see for myself what in the hell was going on in those churches. Excuse my language. Excuse my language. But hell is a common word and a condition we all commonly share. So it shouldn't offend anybody. I used to see, this, see what was, hear what was happening, so I wanted to see what was happening. Believe it or not, the first church I went to, I liked it got knocked out. I'm telling you the truth. God let me experience these things for a purpose. I came to this holiness church. I think it was holiness. I tell you who was the preacher. Reverend Roberts. Roberts Church. It was, uh, let's see where that church was. It was a bit north in Lou West. I think about 40th Street, somewhere like that. State, I think, if I'm not mistaken. See, it's been some time. It was back there. You'd be surprised how old I am. I'm as old as Moses was. Uh, anyway. When I went to this church, before I got in the door, I just got the door almost open. And the door slammed back in my face and almost knocked me out. It didn't hit me, but if it had hit me, I would have been knocked out. Boom! So I opened the door, and there this woman was standing there. Just, <laughs> I said, look, I said, you come to the door again while I'm standing here. And push that door like that. I said, I'm going to really straighten you out. I said, I'm going to knock you down in this floor. And you know what? She sobered up right away. She did. She sobered up right away and went walking on up the aisle. But after about 10 or 15 minutes of that and drum beating, she got back on the job of stumping and stumping, stumping up and down now, boom, boom, and running. And she, I mean, she just got to running. When she got the, the Holy Ghost, it made her just rip and run. And she would open the slam in the door and slam out of the door. So I began observing what was happening in some of these churches. Finally, I got around to the dignified aristocratic church, the cathedral, the Catholic church. And when I went to the Catholic church, I said, this looks like a doggone funeral service. I'm, I'm telling you how the thing impressed me. I've never gone into these places. I wasn't conditioned. <laughs> To, 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 to know what was, what, what, what was going on, you see. So I had to identify that thing with something that I already knew about. Nobody had explained it to me. So we walked down these old deathly looking aisles. The girl told me I had to come to the Catholic Church before she would come to the temple with me. So I told her, okay, I wanted to go anyway. Excuse me if I don't fasten this old tight suit, uh, suit here. I'm going to leave it open, Mr. I'm okay with you. All right. I walked down the aisle with this sister. The priest was standing, speaking an unknown tongue. It was unknown to me. And when I got out, I asked the girl that she understood what she said. She said some of it. And she was being trained for, I don't know what you call it in the church, but she was being trained for some the, the, the what's the boys that carry something? Altar boys. And then there are girls that they train too for something that do little duties in the church or with the, with the church. I forget what it was, but she was being trained for something. 
And uh, <clears throat> he was standing up there with all of his ghostly clothes on. Believe me, I'm not doing this to make fun. I'm doing this to drive a point home. And that is that this world has been nothing much more than darkness and silence. Though they have been making a lot of noise and shining a lot of four false lights. So he was up there with all his ghost clothes on, saying something in our men. And the pulpit looked like somebody was going to be sacrificed in some black magic ritual. And everybody walked in like it was a death walk. Nobody went in like human beings. They went in. I'm telling you the truth. I'm just describing to you what, what, what was there, you know. They went in like they were doing the death march, you see. And they looked like they had death on their, them on their mind. Maybe all the churches weren't like that. I don't know. But that's how this one, that's the way this one looked. The atmosphere in this one was deathly. So as we came out, the girl kneeled down. She put, no, first she put a quarter or something. I can't remember exactly. But I think she put a quarter somewhere. And then she lit a candle. And she said a prayer. And she kneeled before a statue. I don't rem remember whether it was Mary or some saint, but she kneeled before some statue too. I said, look at these pagan idol worshippers. So that stuck in my mind. Now look, I was, in, I was only about 13 or 14 years old. That experience stuck in my mind. So finally, I got on the, on the rostrum, pulpit, in the temple. They didn't even recognize us as a religion. But we didn't kneel down to no engraving images. Got on the pulpit, and I began to think about that Catholic church. And I said to myself, those people are nothing but cannibals. They are not carrying out the act, but they are going through the ritual of cannibalism. Taking a cracker and biting it, talking about this is the flesh of Christ. Drinking some communal wine, what do you call it? This is the blood of Christ. No wonder they came out with Dracula movies. They got it from the Catholic Church. The idea is they had least. They drinking blood, so that Dracula drinks blood. And he has to have his blood. He can't live without his blood. And they have to have their communion. You can't be a Christian without communion. <laughs> Eating crackers and drinking wine that represent flesh and blood. Now how do you think that's going to affect the mind? No matter how much you love God and righteousness and humanity on the surface, these evil these cannibalistic concepts, these cannibalistic rituals are going to trickle down through your conscious mind into your subconscious and going to make you act as a devil though you believe yourself to be a saint. Now look at Christian society and see what is there. Cannibalism. I was put in jail for not going to the army. And in jail, I became acquainted with Indians, Sioux and other Indians, up there in Sandstone, Minnesota. And those Indians told me of their way of life that was passed down to them by their fathers. And I saw that their way of life was, very, was much, much, much more decent than the way of life that these people call Christians.
established for us in this society. Things that are accepted, not even questioned in this society, I found that those Indians looked down on it and take their nose away from it. It was foul and funky smelling in their nose. But this society do it and feel no shame. And the priest won't come before the television and condemn the society. He won't think, make this world, make this country right, or be the enemy of the church. No, no. He won't break friendship with the government to correct the society. He tolerates these evils because really he's just there to make a business. He's there to make a business and not to make a world for Almighty God. Well, I can't, so I can't go into some of these things. But I'll just give you a little idea of how the manifest how how you can point out the manifestations of this kind of ritualism that is against decency and against God. What do you think feeds the fire of destruction, racism, and hatred in the Ku Klux Klan? It's Christianity. They use Christianity to justify the position, the stand that they take. <laughs> when Christians went to Europe, or pardon me, went from Europe to Africa, as it is called, to conquer the Africans, and take over their wealth. What do you think they use to justify that wicked march of the conqueror? Christianity. When they left Europe and came here and saw a need to wipe out the Indians, what do you think they use to justify that wicked position they took. Christianity. When they went to Africa and brought you and my mother back here in chains, what do you think they used to justify that wicked act? Christianity. Now, if any of you fat-headed preachers in here today want to challenge me on any point that I've made, when I finish, let me see your ugly pig face. as much as they can take 
And when you find they can't take any more, if they haven't come to this point, leave them and come on here and preach this gospel that you accept. But there's another preacher who just comes and listens to go back and be more effective with his own thing. He has no intentions of bringing his people this way. His intention is just to preserve his own power and control over his congregation. Now if that stinking devil they associate me with him and say we are preaching the same thing, you are lying. What you are preaching is wickedness. What you are preaching is enslavement. As long as a preacher holds a cross up with a white man on it, you can name him God, you can name him the he three Hebrew, Hebrew boys in one, you can name him Abraham Lincoln, I don't care what you name him, as long as you hold a white body on a cross before the people and tell them this is the manifestation of God, this is God in the flesh, you are promoting white supremacy, you are feeding it and keeping it in existence, and you are not my brother, how can you be my brother? You know, they are shrewd devil. They are put on the skates of the mighty Satan himself. They know how to skate around truth. Oh, they can figure skate and everything else, you know. They say, well, no matter what flesh God manifests himself in, aren't we one humanity? That's the words of the devil, trying to blind us to the evil that they want to put over. If God picked a man to represent himself as the manifestation of the real person and person of God on earth, and have a particular flesh to put himself in and to represent himself in, if it's black, it's black divine racism. If it's Caucasian, then it's Caucasian divine racism. God never put his finger on a race and said, that's where I exist. That's where I chose to put myself so that I can speak to the world. He have never done that. As corrupt as the Bible is by the interpolation and interpretations that have been made by church leadership, still that Bible does not say that. You have to read it again, brothers and sisters. The Bible never say that Jews, as a flesh people, are the favored people of God. Only as long as they follow in the spirit of God, so the book says, are they worthy to be called the children of God. So the book says. And the book has a, has a, a, a a lot of verses and chapters showing us how God took his blessing away from one of a certain family and put it on another one of another family. How he took his blessing from one people and gave it to another because that people didn't stand up and respect the duties, the duties he placed on them. All right. And again, she is not God. This is me. 
Jesus made it plain. Jesus got hungry. Jesus had to eat. Jesus had to be washed. Jesus even had to be baptized by John. And before that, he was circumcised. And the books say that he was educated and made sanctified. That's what the book says of Jesus. The book says that he grew in knowledge. And Jesus didn't say anything to contradict those things in the scripture. Jesus spoke of himself as a common person, as a human being. He says, I don't know everything. I can't tell you what will happen on tomorrow. Only God knows that. And on the cross, when he was dying, as the Christian book gives it, he said, oh God, oh God, why have you forsaken me? Letting us know that God ain't dying on this cross. It's only me dying on this cross. Oh God, oh my God, oh my God, why have you forsaken me? Letting the world know that God is not dying on the cross. I'm dying on the cross. Then the Christian church take the body that was not God and put it up before me and you and tell you this is God. This is God's body. God manifests himself on earth in his son Christ. Here he is. Pray to Christ. Did they teach your father and your mother to pray to God, the creator of the heaven and earth? Tell me the truth. They told you to pray to Jesus, didn't they? Call on Jesus. Oh, if you get in trouble, just call on Jesus. Jesus never told anybody, if you get in trouble, call on me. He said, if you get in trouble, call on my heavenly father. That is not only my heavenly father, but it's also your heavenly father. But the plan, the plan of making a white body, the vessel holding Almighty God, was part of the plan to enslave all the darker people of the world. I said all the darker people of the world. Europe came up with Christianity and they saw they had a powerful thing that would give them control over the whole world. They said if we can pull all white people together, so-called white, I don't call them white. This paper is white. Snow is white. The Caucasian race is pink, orange, red, blue, pale, they all kind of colors. All right, now, they said if we can get the world all to call us white folks, and show Christ as a white man, if we go into their land and tell them that the savior of the world is Christ, a white man, they will look at us as saviors, led by divine savior. They will include us in the holy family, in the divine family. And when they rebel against us, once we get in control over them, if they rebel against us, in, their, in the back of their mind, something will be knocking and holding them back, saying, don't attack the image of God. So they plan to put the white man's image deep in the minds and hearts of all God's people. So that when you rise up, something would trick in your mind and wouldn't even speak clearly to your mind because the trick was so subtle. The trick was so hid. 
that a language wasn't spoken. Only a symbol was given. So when you start to rise up and protect yourself, a message won't come in words. Only a symbol, a signal will come. And you won't even recognize what it is. It will come as a feeling telling you, don't attack master. And that has been the condition of the black world until the light came from the east and signed even unto the west. Because that was keeping you in the corral. The church teaching is nothing but a corral for the work animals of America to keep your work animals. They design that corral and they use all the teachings that they could possibly out of context. Don't hate those who hate you. Turn the other cheek and pray for those who spitefully use you. If your enemy take your cloak, give him also your what? Yeah, give him your underclothes, your socks and your shoes. And go on and walk away naked. No, don't get, don't get angry. And if your enemy come and ask you to walk a mile with you, what does it say? Don't walk just a mile with him. Walk two miles with him. Now look, that's what our fathers and mothers were fed into their minds and hearts by the church preacher. To keep us quiet, submissive, obedient to wicked, cruel leadership. We wondered how come the black community didn't rise up by the thousands and throw stones or sticks to do something when the Caucasian took an innocent one of them and lynched it, set his body afire and burned them alive while they drank and have a party before the burning court. They, they wonder, outside society, they wonder, how come we didn't rebel? They thought the white man's physical might, that his physical weapon, had intimidated us to the extent that we wouldn't move. No, it was not. It was his Christianity that held us in check. We feared that God didn't want us to do that. That we wouldn't be satisfied in Christ if we behaved like that. The greatest chain they put on us was Christ. Let anybody condemn it. Let anybody condemn it. It wasn't the physical chain, brother and sister. The greatest chain that this world ever put on you and me was Jesus Christ. We have to get the truth out. We wanted to be like Jesus. Oh, I've got to talk on. It's getting late, but I'm going to tell you this. Because they had designed that message to make everybody that had any innocence in them, everybody that had any real sincerity, they would want to be like Jesus. Because Jesus was the ideal human being. So they fed us this Jesus to make us want to be like Jesus. The people that were more uh, uh, susceptible, more open, 
to this bait that they were going to give the world was those who suffered like Jesus suffered. You see? And who are they? They are the poor outcasts. They are the poor rejected people of the world. They wonder how come the Indian wouldn't buy the bait. See, these Indians are poor. They are primitive. But they weren't poor in the sense that we were poor. And that many other people over the world were poor. So when they tried to feed this bait to the Indian, the Indian said, no. I don't want it. Take it back home, pale face. They had a hell of a time getting the Indian, the American Indian, to buy Christianity. In fact, even today they don't have them all accepting Christianity. Most of the Indians, they have their own idea about what religion should be or what it is. So they had to wipe them out. That shows you that Christianity was their safeguard. You understand? Any people that wouldn't accept Christianity had to be wiped out because that people wouldn't have a safety, what you call it, something to hold them in check. Bam! They wouldn't have no safety valve on them, you see? So the Indian, if he didn't accept the church, how could we contain him? How could we judge him? How could we keep him in order? But if we put a safety valve on him, Christianity, the moment he get hot and the steam starts shooting out, say, wait a minute, you're going to bust the valve, and the valve is holy. That's Christ you're about to break. <laughs> to get the Indian to accept it. So they say, we're going to have to kill them out. We're going to have to beat them down, rip them down, cut them down to, to small enough numbers and put them on reservation so that we don't have to worry about them. But the black man of America, they all just keep working on his head and his heart with Jesus. And in time, we can let him integrate. Because he will be safe. No risk in our society. We can sleep sound at night. The faith of our Jesus Christ will certainly go off if he get out of order. And we won't have to go and adjust, make adjustments to keep the steam down. Good Christian Blackie will do it himself. And that's what our community has been like. The preacher has stood out front, right? Telling us how Americans are supposed to be. How Christians, what Christians are supposed to be. And you are supposed to be Christian folks. We are Christian folks. I don't care what you hear others doing. Remember you are Christ people. We belong to Jesus. <laughs> Hold up. So they tell you when you begin to get ready to slap the face of that lion that turned into a bear, then the bear turned into a monster out of some horror book, and you get ready to slap that ugly, vicious monster. Preacher, grab your hand. Wait a minute, brother. What are you about to do? Say, Reverend, I'm about to stop this dog from killing more of us. Dog, remember Jesus. Put your hand on the cross and remember Jesus. And poor brother, nursed all about and 
walk away if he can. So how can I tell you that God is going to let the army of cross carriers walk in the same gate of his kingdom that me and these followers walk in? I can't tell you that. Those who carry the cross, they're going to be stopped at the gate. And you're going to be questioned. And haven't you heard the truth of the cross? And if you just happen to be one of those who's so far away from hearing, that you actually didn't hear it, it will be explained to you. And you will be told, your heart is good, but your mind is wrong. So if you will exchange your own mind for the right mind, you can get the reward that your good heart has earned. And many of those, they're going to be so selfish, so self-righteous, so devoted to Jesus because Jesus in their subconscious is themselves. That they ain't going to take him off that cross. They're going to say, no, I'm a Christian, and this is my sacred sign. Christ is the Lord. And lose all the reward that their good heart had earned them. Then others will be asked, and they will confess. Yes, we heard the message exposing the evils of the cross. Well, why you come here with it? You're going to be cast away. And your hell will be an eternity. Because you won't have a chance until the whole creation has vanished. Now I'm telling you this, brothers and sisters. So that if there are some out there who really want to go right, you'll make up your mind today, knowing the truth. Our fathers and mothers, they used to sing a song about the cross, the old emblem, emblem of suffering, shame, and death. Your slave grandparents had more sense than you. They said, someday I hope to exchange this old cross for a starry crown. They didn't want it. They understood that it was a first, an evil thing on Jesus. And that Jesus in heaven would not have the cross but would have a solid crown. And they wanted to one day get rid of the cross and get their solid crown. So if the cross is something that we hope to get rid of, why carry it? Why carry it? Let me tell you another powerful evil of the cross. along with this white supremacist power, it also has a power that is death. The cross makes the people who love the cross lose respect for life. They cherish the sign of death and they worship a God 
that is victorious in the grave. So they begin to subconsciously look to the grave for victory. They even wait to, to, uh, until they reach the grave to repent and stop doing their evil doing. They wait until they feel death coming on. Then they say, go get a priest. I'm ready to confess my sin. They feel that it's not necessary to really get serious about anything until the graveyard door opens up. <laughs> That's right. So believe in Christ. Carry the cross on your neck. And go in brother's bed room tonight and lay with his wife. Go out in the morning to your business and sell liquor to the wine head. Spray the alcoholism. But when you feel death coming on you, call the priest. Tell him you're ready to confess. It makes you respect death, love death, and disrespect life, and hate life. Where in the world is life any more disrespected and abused than it is in Christian land, under Christian rule? Look what this government tolerated from the plantation during our captivity, this Christian nation. Look what they tolerate now out there in the street. You got to put yourself in jail to keep people out of your house. Bars all up to your window, you in jail. Right? You got to lock yourself up in jail to keep people out of your house from killing you and taking your goods from you. Is that right? Where else in this world can you go and find people locking themselves up in jail to keep criminals out of their house? I haven't seen that anywhere I've gone and I've been to quite a few places over this world. I haven't seen any place where people had to lock themselves up in jail to keep the criminal out. That means the public has been taken over by criminals and the good people are already safe in jail. brothers and sisters, how else can you judge the society if you are not going to judge them by the realities that exist all around you? I said that this crucifix, this cross, it works to make you love death and disrespect life. You carry the sign of death. When the coffin comes along, you take your head off. Traffic stops. Poor man ain't carrying nothing but a corpse. That's dead and ruined. To be placed in the ground. And go back to dirt. And the traffic stops for him now. But at one point, one time in his life, perhaps he carried God's fruit. And nobody stopped for him. But 
perhaps he carried a fair legislation, a fair bill to present to the, to the justice, and nobody stopped for him. He was moving to defend his helpless wife, or his helpless children, or his helpless neighbor, and nobody stopped for him. They all trampled him down in his path. But now that he's nothing but a dead cop, Christian America take their hats off to the grave and stop the traffic for the grave. But won't do anything for the living world but send it down into the grave. Now what do you think God is going to do with a hellish place like this? He's going to give the government the power over to me or he's going to wipe them away. Believe it or not. We don't 
don't have to be the machinery. We are the power. Do you understand? If, if you think that I will have to become China and Arabia and Europe and the United States, then you have the wrong idea of what I'm talking about. Those are only parts in a great machinery. I mean that God is going to give me the power and the wheels are going to turn by the power that he's going to bless me with. And when I say me, I mean this body. You don't believe it? Live on! Just don't die. And you're going to live to see it. The only way you don't see it, you die. Yeah. What I'm calling you to is this. I'm calling you to light and understand divine light and divine understanding. I'm calling you to natural truth. Truth that was established naturally in the earth. That God himself planted in the order of creation and grew it out. And then he blessed it with his own inspiration so that that truth will continue to grow, grow until it gets in divine dimension. I am calling you to come back to that truth. To come out of the church. Have to make it plain to you. I'm asking you to come out of the church. Come out of the Bible that is the graveyard of all the dark and oppressed people of the world. Come out of that Bible. That Bible is not safe for any human being to live in. If you want to hold on to the Bible, if you love it, then come into the new Bible that I am giving you in the form of correct interpretation. You don't think much is still what I am teaching you, I guess. I know you Christians, you read what I put in the paper. You can't see any value in it that justify you putting down what you got. Well, you're pitiful. You're really pitiful. You rather hold on to the Sunday school, kindergarten, fairy tale presentation, than to come into the college of Muhammad. You are pitiful. You think that the, that the masses, that the many uneducated people around you are still so beneath you that you have to keep them with that kind of fairy tale kindergarten preaching. You are wrong. You are making a big mistake. The people don't come to you to listen and follow what you're saying. Most of them come to you now, preachers, to see you lie. To see how big a lie you're going to tell them this Sunday. They come to see 
how well the choir can perform this Sunday. I'm telling you what the majority of them are coming to you for now, preacher. They're coming to see just how big a hypocrite you can be. They don't even think you're serious anymore. And they're right. They think that you're an actor. And they're coming to see your act. But you let the community get in trouble, you can't lead them nowhere, preacher. You can't get this community to do nothing. Can't even get your congregation to do anything. If you want your congregation to do something about the problems in your, in your community, you can't get them to act behind you. Because you haven't conditioned them, you haven't qualified them to follow any real leadership. You have conditioned them, qualified them to only be emotional monkeys and clowns under you. That's all you qualified them to do. So when you get in trouble, real trouble in the society, you can't even depend on your congregation. Because they're not really followers. They're spectators. They're there to see you clown. And the proof of that, the biggest clown has the biggest congregation today, don't they? The Catholic Church, what holds it together? That's all. The people go to Catholicism because it's a symbol. It's a symbol of well-to-do. It's a symbol of sophistication. It's a symbol of dignity. So those who have been starving for just a symbol, just a dress of dignity, they wear Catholicism. You better put down it, put it down, brother, before it's too late. If you come up too late, you're not going to get a place here with us. Not here. You're going to have to sit out there until you perform a divine miracle. <laughs> right, I wouldn't trust the preacher who see what's going on in this day and time and wait up, wait until we get over and he come up here talking about I want to join. I wouldn't trust him to be a chauffeur for us. Let me, uh, I'm going to let you go in a few minutes. But let me, uh, let me point out a few things in the scripture to show you how you are being robbed. Of real scriptural teaching. I'll start with Genesis. Genesis says, let there be light. The church won't tell you that that means let there be knowledge in the heads of the people. Let the human society grow in knowledge. They make you think it means spiritualism. It means knowledge, some sense in your head. That's the first commandment. Let the brain grow in intelligence. Let the head be lit with light. That's the first commandment. Because the head is the, it's the head. And if there's no light in the head, what can we expect in the body? The head has to rule over the body. Is that right? So the 
first commandment, let there be light, let there be intelligence. Do you know the church? Persecuted education? Persecuted educators? That's what brought on the Renaissance. There was a movement against church leadership. Is that right? The Renaissance was a movement against church leadership. So we wouldn't have this advanced science. We wouldn't have free education, public school, if there hadn't been a, an uprising to overthrow church leadership. Do you understand that? So that's a clear fact in history that tells us that the church did not obey the first letter of the Bible. Let there be light. They knew they were limited, so they felt the only way to keep ourselves on the throne is to keep knowledge from the, from the masses, from the majority. Don't you didn't need any schooling. Don't worry about that. The bishop's son will get the schooling. The priest's son will get the schooling. You subjects, stay in your places. I believe that's described Christianity back in those days. See, we got historians up here. If I go wrong, they can correct me. All right. What else do we find? Coming up from Genesis now. Genesis says that there was two brothers. Tell us there's two brothers. Cain and Abel. Ab Abel was killed by Cain. The church has been preaching this for I don't know how long. But how many of you know what that means? All you know is it means that you shouldn't kill your brother. Is that right? You didn't need God to tell you that. Animals know better than that. In fact, they don't even kill their own kind. They fight each other, but most of animals won't kill their own kind. They kill another kind but not their own kind. So why God had to tell you, don't kill your brother? You go in the jungle where church, religion, and education, civilization have never been. And you will find people back there in the jungle you call primitive. They know in their hearts not to kill their brother. And they don't kill their brother as much as you do over here with all your Jesus Christ. So how many of you have really been taught what it means for Cain not to kill Abel? What that means? Cain should not kill Abel. And that if someone killed Cain for killing Abel, his punishment meant a be sevenfold worse than Cain's punishment. This is the beginning of the Bible. You're a Christian. And I don't care where you came from. How many can tell me what it means? I know what they've taught you. They've taught you nothing but Sunday school, kindergarten language. All right, let's come on up some more. If you want me to tell you, I can tell you. You don't have the time today. But in time, I'll tell you. And I challenge the Pope to prove I'm wrong. If he can find anything in his Bible or in his, in his law or anything, to, con to condemn me other than the lies that they have added that I can easily dis dispel with a little truth. So he will be disarmed right away. Now, if with what he's left with to fight with, if he can condemn me, I'll eat the whole Bible up dry with not a drop of water. And I know that's a hard thing to do, eat all that paper and cardboard. Coming on up in the Bible now, we find that some people went to the city of Nod and took themselves wives from another people. 
and the book hadn't told us that there were any other people but the people that came from Adam and Eve. Where did these other people come from? Have you been taught that? The old witnesses, they try to teach their people, but most of you haven't been taught anything on that subject. All right, let's come on up a little further now. Sons came from, sons and daughters came from Adam. Called Tubal Cain, Jubal Cain. Daughters called Adar. Have the church told you anything about them? Well, they're very important. In Genesis, they're very important. Very important to Christianity, to anybody who believes in the Bible. But they haven't taught you anything, have you? Even before that, there's a snake in the garden and a forbidden tree and a fruit that you shouldn't eat. What is the forbidden fruit? When I was a boy, most of the people thought it was sex. Thought sex was a forbidden fruit. What is it? Does anybody know here? What is the forbidden fruit? Did the church teach you? An apple. Somebody said an apple. And you've been eating apples all your life. The a Christian eating apples all your life. Now let's come up a little more. Moses being pursued by Pharaoh's army struck the water and the sea parted. The Red Sea parted. And Moses and his people walked across on dry land. Have the preacher told you what that means? Well, that's all it means, that God had the power to produce that great miracle. Well, you will never convert intelligent people with just that. You need a little bit more than that. We don't see any seas parting now. No matter how holy the people are, we don't see the sea opening up and dry, a dry road made in the sea. We don't see things like that happen. Miraculous things take place, but I'm, we haven't seen that one. And I think if, if anything like that was, was possible, not that God can't do it, but he has a better way of doing things than that. But if that was the way he do things, does things, pardon me. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that as long as we suffered, as much as we cried in the name of Jesus, holding fast to all that we had from the church and from the Bible, that Almighty God would open up some dry path for us, I would have produced something for us, a bridge or something for us to go up on and walk over America back into a better land. And when the American Christians, the plantation owners, pursued us on that bridge, he would have collapsed it. He, he could have been able to do that for us, right? I would think so. If he did that for the Hebrews that was under, in bondage, and their bondage wasn't as cruel on them as ours was on us, then it seems to me that as hard as our preachers preach in, in, in slavery, and as much as we sang praise of God and called on Jesus, that he would have produced a miracle similar to that one for us. The church is satisfied with you, eating the baby language, keeping your mind on kindergarten level, so they can continue to rule you and give you nothing of what God has promised in the book. Okay, let's move on up now. Since that's such, such a 
powerful part of the scripture, so powerful that uh, uh, who was that uh, uh, made it, uh, what was that uh, producer's name that made this movie? Cesar B. DeMille made the movie, The Ten Commandments, you know, and that was his, his, his prided piece. The scene showing the separation of the water. When iron is heated to a great degree, it gets red. Pale people, when they get angry, they get red. So the ancient people use red to describe anger, for anger. Water means people. Ask your preacher, he'll tell you that in the Bible, water means people. Red Sea means angry people. Moses struck the water means he struck moral justice. He appealed to their moral uh, conscience. And when he appealed to their moral conscience, the angry people backed off and let Moses and his people walk through them. He didn't strike the land, he struck the water. Those people who had moral conscience like they had, he appealed to them. And when he did it, Pharaoh's army said, let, let them go. We shouldn't keep them. Let them go. Pharaoh, he didn't like it. He sent his men out to pursue them, right? And when he and his men went out, say they were drowned in the water. What does that mean? That the people stopped them, wouldn't let them pursue Moses and his, and his people. When they came, the ranks closed in again, and they wouldn't let Moses, uh, Pharaoh and his army pursue Moses and his people. Say, no, let those people go. We've we agreed to let them go. Let them go. They rebelled against Pharaoh. That's what it means. It means that people rebelled against Pharaoh and refused to obey his order. After Moses appealed to their conscience, to their moral conscience. It's as simple as that. But if you're still in kindergarten, you don't want to accept that. You like the painted pictures, the fairy tales, <laughs> the make-believe, more than you like reality. Now that's, that's a message worthwhile, isn't it? That's a message worth being in a book, carried by grown-up. But if the message is only that God made the sea back up, that's, that's not worthy for me to carry on under my arm. My baby, my four-year-old, all ought to be carrying that. But if God is saying to me that you should trust the moral conscience that exists in the people, it's there. If you don't have no other recourse, then appeal to their moral conscience. And you'll find that people as, on, as a majority are morally persuaded. Now, isn't that a fact of life? People as a majority are morally persuaded. That's what the book is telling us. And that if we can't get any, 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 any uh, agreement from our rulers, then appeal to the moral conscience of the public. And you'll find that there will be enough support in the moral conscience of the public to overthrow those wicked rulers. That's what the book is saying. And wicked rulers, 
They know this, brother and sister. That's why they deny the man who is right and just. In the time when the, uh, they, are, they, they, they have a, a, critical, a critical grip on the masses, they deny the man who's right and just the opportunity to speak to the public. They're killing him before they let him speak to the public. Why? Because they know if he gets the opportunity to speak his piece open and clear to the public, he'll get enough support. Because God has not made human beings corrupt. He has made human beings to move when his spirit touches them. And Satan never had the majority. Satan always have a minority. We can move on up through the Bible relating to you these Sunday school fairy tales and show you the real social message that's in these stories. And you'll see just how much you've been deprived of real knowledge, divine guidance by your leadership, your church leadership. Now, if you want to go back to them and let them entertain you, you just go on. But I want you to know that you are worth nothing. You are no good. You are not worth anything as a human being. If you are worth anything as a human being, you won't go back in that church and clown with them. You'll go into that church and you'll try to tell them, say, look, you have to change. There's a man in Chicago on Stony Island that have a much more powerful interpretation and presentation of this book than you have, Reverend. You have to change. That's what you would do. But no, if you care more about a book shop than you do about humanity, if you care more about a wine bottle than you do about a humanity, you care more about your little petty weaknesses than you do about the whole humanity and God, you'll go back to that church and be entertained again and forget all about your visit to the temple. Well, if you do, let me tell you, every time you look in the mirror, you remember that I say you're looking at nothing. But I'm like,
Now, question number two. All those of you who are here today for your first time, and those who are here for your second or third time, who have not yet become a part of this great nation of Islam, the body of Christ, I'm speaking now to you. Those who are here for your first, second, or third time, those who have not yet become a registered member of the nation of Islam, this question is... As alaikum Brothers and sisters, you all heard the Honorable Wallace D. Muhammad. And we're going to ask the same questions right here. How many of you are here for your first time, never been to Muhammad's Temple of Islam before? Can I see by the raise of your hands? Please stand up. Please stand up where you are. Please stand up. Please stand up. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. Remain standing. Remain standing. Remain standing where you are, please. We have two more questions that we'd like to ask you. Those of you that are standing, and also if there's any of you that have visited the temple and have not yet accepted this truth, how many of you believe that what you have heard here this afternoon 